everyone and welcome! Today's project is going to be recovering an antique parasol frame that I picked up nine years ago. I did also get the fabric around the same time, so it has been sitting in my to-do pile for a good while. It's not a terribly difficult project, it's just one that I hadn't gotten around to. So like all good projects, we have to start with the research. Parasols, specifically, are meant to be canopy items that protect the user from the sun or heat or other types of weather that are not water-based. We tend to think of umbrellas as more appropriate for the rain or snow and parasols as more appropriate for the sun and the heat. In part, this is due to the terminology. Sol is the Latin word for sun, and the English term umbrella does come from the Latin word umbra for shade or shadow. So they both seem to have a pretty similar root concept, but in terms of what we think of as the modern difference, parasols are for sun, umbrellas are for rain. The far back history of the parasol is something that goes far, far further back than I can manage. You see plenty of examples of a canopied sunshade throughout the ancient Egyptian period, Asia, India, Persia, all over the place for thousands of years. It doesn't, however, really make its way into popularity in Europe until at least the 16th century. At this point, we start to see it appear in artworks and imagery, but it's really not until the 18th century that it takes off as a common accessory meaning that you start to regularly see it being sold in use, not just in occasional imagery of the more wealthy, but you also see it being used by other classes. This is in no small part due to the technological advancements that occurred during the 18th and 19th century, making this a much more functional and easy to acquire and really not terribly expensive piece. But it's something that the 19th century mentions as being an accessory that can be found in all sorts of classes. So it's not just for the highest fashionable classes, but it is something relatively inexpensive enough and desirable enough that you will find farm girls and maids, as they put it, using them when they go to church on Sundays and generally showing them off because they understand that though the purpose of the parasol is to keep the sun off of you, keep you cool, prevent skin damage, it's also purely fashion, and even if they're only using it for two hours a week, as this article claims, they are still looking for an item which has a very becoming appearance to it and is very flattering to the person carrying it. So parasols can be purely fashionable as well as functional. I personally find them incredibly functional. I used to work at Colonial Williamsburg and working in the heat of Virginia during the summer with the hot sun and the humidity where it is nearly a tropical environment. A parasol is a lifesaver. I carried that thing everywhere. That is why you wore hats when you go out. It prevents the sun from hitting your face. It cools you off so much, but that parasol, such a big difference. So that purpose alone warrants this being a very, very useful and functional item, but the added aspect of fashion is always present in these sorts of accessories. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, parasols start to become what we are more familiar with in terms of the actual mechanical structure. While they are collapsible early on, the format in which they collapse is slightly different than we're used to. All of the systems of the little tabs on the side and the springs and the hinges to actually have the canopy and ribs open up are all gradual patented things that really move the technology of the parasol forward. This also means that we are moving away from baleen being used for the ribs, which is a very useful and functional type of rib. It's very strong, but flexible. You can curve it with heat, but it's really pretty difficult to break. So they're very, very functional types of ribs. As we move into the 19th century, you do start to see metal being introduced as an option that's very lightweight, very strong, and long-lasting. And we start to also see metal being used more commonly in the handles as well. You can also see inlays of mother of pearl and ivory, or entire handles of ivory. There's a whole range of different style options and sizes and carvings. It just seems almost infinite in terms of the variety of styles that you see throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. One of the other types of ribs that I've come across and we'll actually be dealing with today is that of wood or reed. 
In my particular case, I'm dealing with Reed, but they're very similar, meaning that they have the same problems. Both wood and reed can dry out and become fairly brittle and fragile. In the case of my reed, I actually ended up with a little bit of a split in one of them, which I mentioned on Instagram. And Brandon McKinney, who does amazing recovering of parasols, if you have not seen his work before, highly recommend going and checking that out. And he talked about how that's really the toughest material to deal with in terms of the parasol rib options because the dryness can really make it very difficult. And I live in a desert now. In addition to the changes in the ribs and that structural part of the canopy, there are also some other interesting inventions that happen along the way. One of which is a hinge that sits in the middle of the parasol stick meaning that it can essentially fold in half, which means that it's very good for travel or carrying around with you during the day. I came across a great reference in 1850 that was published in Punch magazine, where a gentleman is bemoaning the use of parasols by women because they are apparently an absolute danger when on the omnibus or other types of public transportation. He does admit that they are a very useful defense item for women, but he is more annoyed at the accidental use as a weapon when on public transportation and that women are jabbing and poking and accidentally, theoretically, hurting other people on the omnibus with this long pointy tool. So the invention of this folding parasol probably came as a great relief to this gentleman who had proposed that we simply ban carrying parasols on the omnibus, but obviously that creates its own issues. So I think this might have solved it for both the ladies who wanted to carry their parasols and the gentleman who did not want to be poked by them. The parasol that I'm working with today actually does have that sort of hinge in its stick, and it's a really interesting but simple device. You do see types earlier on where they will have a tilt to their canopy, where there is a similar type of hinge, but it doesn't actually allow the whole thing to fold in half, just to sort of tilt to the side in case you have a raking sunlight. You'll see both small and large canopies used throughout the 19th century. You will see the curved and rounded shape. You will see the flat style. You will see the more curvy pagoda style. There is a whole range of different options with the actual shapes of the ribs. You also have a variety of shapes when it comes to the canopy edges, whether they are concave, convex, straight, pointed, you can add ruffles or fringe or any sort of trimming to the edges depending on what is fashionable. You'll also see a variety of different fabrics being used. Silks are obviously very popular. You can also find examples in advertisements talking about wool or cotton or linen options for the covers. So there is a whole wide variety of different types of fabrics that can go onto your parasols. And though there are plenty of mentions of what is in or out in terms of this particular season and this particular year, they do have some more universal recommendations. Namely, that you should not only make sure that it coordinates well with your clothing, namely that you should have a very dark dress and a bright white parasol or vice versa. It's too stark of a difference that it should be something that is flattering and coordinating. Gray seems to come up as a very popular and neutral option, but also that you want to make sure that the color that is falling upon your face as the light filters through it is also flattering. So in those cases, you might occasionally find linings to the parasols. They specify in the 1860s that you should use white or occasionally pink if you have the correct skin tone for pink, but there's so many different options that are available for parasols in any given time period. But the one that I'm going to be working with today is more appropriate to the late 1850s and early 1860s. This is because it is that folding style of parasol that really was popular during that time period. It's a very nice small size. It's easy for traveling. And I really want to try one of the more decorative styles with fringe as well from that era. It's just such an interesting time period for parasols. But I think after doing this, I might end up hunting down some more parasol frames because I really enjoyed this. And though I have recovered parasols twice before, I honestly always forget how much I love doing this. So I think I need to hunt down some more antique parasol frames and do a whole range of different options for the 18th and 19th century in my future because this is kind of a fun little project that only takes a day or two depending on how much decoration you're putting on the piece or if you're lucky enough that it still has an original cover on it and you can use that as a pattern it can go really quickly and it is such a fun and useful accessory to have in your arsenal of historic costumes. 
Since my antique parasol does not actually have a pre-existing cover, even in bad condition, the first step I have to do is to make a pattern for it. So I'm just measuring the length of the ribs and then measuring the distance between them. I assume that they're not perfectly set up, so I'm measuring half of the exterior circumference so that way I can average it out. And I'm doing the same thing a few inches up where the hinge is, double checking that measurement. Very often you'll find that these aren't perfect triangles. Since the parasols do curve a little bit, you'll need to end up curving the triangle a little bit as well. It essentially will end up flaring out in that middle space. Since I have the length of the ribs, but not necessarily of the center of each piece, I'm going to go ahead and draw a curve that's the same distance from that top point. Then I can figure out how wide that bottom edge needs to be, and that will make sure that my outer legs of the triangle will actually be the correct length. And then measuring down from the center and finding out how far across that middle measurement needs to sit. I'm also double checking with the actual parasol just to make sure that I'm on the right track. And then I'm drawing the legs out. I found that the angle didn't quite match up perfectly, which is something I expected, but it went the opposite way of what I expected, meaning that I ended up with needing to either make a slightly larger middle or a slightly smaller bottom than I expected. So I went ahead and sort of averaged between the two, thinking that perhaps measuring that exterior circumference, I was a little bit more off. And I went ahead and started to cut out some China silk as a sort of mock-up. I actually don't have any muslin around right now, so this was my best option. This is also something that works out well because parasols of this time can actually have a lining on the interior, which will help to finish it off. So I'll just end up using this China silk as the lining, provided that it does remotely fit. I pinned the mock-up through the holes that are in the canes, which is something that I've done with my metal ones before and should not have done with this cane one because I had forgotten that one of the canes was actually already slightly split and partway through this process, the pin just split it further because there was slightly too much tension. I had made the mock-up just a smidge too small, but very slight difference. So I re-evaluated the shape and the size of everything once I realized that that was probably uh, not going to work in its final format, and also realizing that I was going to have to repair that rib. So I went and redrew that angle down at the bottom. I also then went to repair the cane that I had managed to split further than it originally was split. I used a cement to reconnect the two pieces. They had only split, they hadn't broken off. And then I wanted to add a little bit of extra reinforcement around the exterior. So I laid down just a little bit more cement and I grabbed a heavy silk thread, which I then essentially wrapped around where the split section was just below where the little hole is drilled out for the cover to be attached. I don't necessarily think this is going to make a huge difference, but it's a little bit of added security just in case the split does try to open up just a little bit. I then went to actually cutting out not only the fabric pieces, but the fringe as well. I decided that I wanted about a five or six inch fringe around the exterior of the parasol. And rather than making this myself or trying to find some antique stuff that matched, I decided I was just going to fray out a strip of the fabric instead. Thank you. 
I started off initially by ironing open all of the seams flat, but I realized later on that I probably should have ironed them to one side or the other, so keep that in mind as you go forward. Before I went and tried the more final form of the cover on the parasol, I went ahead and rolled and basted back the edges. I did this because the fabric was fraying so much and I wasn't actually going to be rolling and finishing the edges that way, but instead sandwiching the edges in between with a lining. So I just needed them folded back in a way that wasn't going to continue to fray as I worked. Then went ahead and tried on the parasol cover, finding that it was a little bit too big in the center. So I went back and readjusted all of those pieces to be a little bit narrower up at the top and to end a little bit sooner. It wasn't a big deal to take that seam allowance in. I would rather take that in than have to let other parts out. Another thing to note here is that if you don't have a finial that is easily removed, you'll want to make sure that you stop stitching one of the seams just about half an inch further down, so that way you can fit it over the finial. If it's a little bit larger finial, you might actually need to leave two seams slightly unstitched at the top, so that way you can get it over the finial and then go in and hand tack that down later. I also realized at this point that by folding over those edges, they sort of gave me a little bit of a pocket in each seam corner. So that meant that I could just fit that pocket over the ends of the ribs and not actually have to use the holes just yet, which is probably the safer option in the case of these reeds. The canopy itself is stitched on at least in two places. You might need three depending on the size and the shape of your parasol, but obviously you'll need stitches at the very ends where there's usually a hole in the rib for the stitching, but you'll also want to do a reinforcement stitch just at the hinge. Shouldn't obviously go over the hinge, otherwise it'll end up rubbing and cutting, but just after the hinge. So that way as the thing folds up, it stays secure in the middle as well.